Good morning, and welcome to Waterford Mennonite Church. Welcome to those who are tuning in by live stream, and welcome to those who are watching the service at a later date. Thank you for coming together in worship this morning. Today, we will begin a two-service exploration of racial injustice, though the time that could and should be spent on this topic far exceeds these two Sunday morning services. Today, we will be focusing on learning and worshipful lament. Grief and lament are holy spaces to occupy, and this morning we will occupy them together as we sing, give, pray, and learn. We will venture outside of our comfort zones and watch a TED Talk about a topic called intersectionality, which must intertwine with our understanding of racism. I want to provide you all with a roadmap for where we are going within this huge topic. Each of our services will revolve around a central theme, settled at the intersection of learning and worship, while staying under the umbrella of racial justice. Today's service focuses first on recognition of racial injustice, and also on lamenting racial injustice, and lamenting this intersection of racism with other forms of oppression. Next week's service will include more sharing from members of our congregation, focusing on how we are in it together to learn hard things and do the hard work of fighting for racial justice. These services may feel heavy, and depending on who you are and your identity, the weight of this heaviness may be different. I encourage you all to practice self-care as we enter into this heartbreak together. More specifically, today we will practice recognition and lament throughout the service. Our sermon is a TED Talk called The Urgency of Intersectionality by lawyer, civil rights advocate, and critical race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw. In this TED Talk, we will learn that race and other identities cross and intersect in different combinations in humans creating unique experiences for all of us. We will learn that oppression, including racial, is fluid. We will learn that when talking about racial justice, we cannot leave out black women. As Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes articulates, when black women are free, we are all free. We will hear Kimberly Crenshaw say the names of black folks who were killed. When we say their names, we are calling out for justice. This service comes out of the context of this summer, 2020. George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, and Breonna Taylor were all killed by police this summer, leading to a national movement calling for justice. We will hear Kimberly Crenshaw be honest about the deaths of black people at the hands of the police. This is not to inspire hate against police, but to spark awareness of racial injustice. After all, as sociologist Brene Brown explains, Holding people and institutions accountable is not shaming or hating them. These services were created so that we as a church community can grieve the death of our neighbors in Christ, bear witness, as said by Kimberly Crenshaw, and join the work for racial justice. Our call to worship this morning is a prayer written by Christian Smith a Unitarian Universalist pastor in California. God, let us wake up, not just from the Sunday morning exhaustion, from the wish for a few more drowsy minutes in bed. Let us wake up to this world we live in, to its beauty and wonder, and also to its tragedy and pain. We must wake up to this reality that not all in our world have what we do, however much or little that is. We must wake up to the idea that our wholeness, our lives, are only as complete as the lives of those around us, of those we are inextricably tied to in a great web of mutuality, all of which we are a part. We must hashtag stay woke in the words of our friends and colleagues involved in Black Lives Matter, working every day for racial justice in our country. Let us wake up, let us stay awake, let us hashtag stay woke. And now in this time and place, let us worship together, amen. 
Today, our peace lamp represents holding space for lamenting the lack of peace in our world. We lament the murder of black bodies. We lament the continuing harm to them, especially those of black women. Today, we also lament the complexity and fluidity of oppressive systems. We lament the defensiveness that prevents us from learning more. We lament our participation in systems that harm others, our neighbors, and this world. We thank God for the ability to lament and to grieve. We cry out for justice to flow like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. For the healing of the nations, Lord, we pray with one accord. For a just and equal sharing of the things that earth affords. To a life of loving action, help us rise and pledge our word. Lead your people into freedom from despair, your world release. That redeemed from war and hatred, all may come and go in peace. Show us how through care and goodness, fear will die and hope increase. All that kills abundant living, let it from the earth be banned. Pride of status, race, or schooling, dogmas that obscure your plan. In our common quest for justice, may we hallow life's brief span. You creator God have written your great name on humankind. For our growing inner likeness, bring the life of Christ to mind. That by our response and service, earth its destiny may find. Today, we will be taking a special offering for the Center for Community Justice. An important thing that primarily white middle-class churches can do in the fight for racial justice is offer financial resources. The Center for Community Justice in Elkhart was chosen because though their goals are not explicitly and only racial justice, they do important work in the criminal justice systems and school systems. The criminal justice system is disproportionately harsh towards black people, and the school to prison pipeline is a way of criminalizing black youth early on in their lives. Supporting this organization is supporting racial justice work. This is one way our church can show up for our community. This will be an above budget offering in addition to regular offerings. If you would like to give, you can mail in a check to the church with CCJ in the subject line or donate online. A one-time gift like this can be done without setting up a new account and password. Just click on the other fund and then specify CCJ in the description field. Thank you for your consideration and giving to this important offering. I encourage you all to take the time to review the list of prayer concerns and praises found in the bulletin. You can access the bulletin by going to our church website and then clicking on the tab for resources and underneath that you will find a link for the bulletins. You will see that there's a lot happening in the lives of those in our community. There is much that we are called to carry to God in prayer. So I invite you now into a time of prayer for those in our faith community. This morning I will conclude our prayer by praying the words from Psalms 85. Please join me in prayer. God, we gather this morning as your people, and we lament the realities of violence, hatred, and racism. We confess the ways that we have been complacent and the times when we have not spoken up for our brothers and sisters of color. 
We confess our sins and ask for your forgiveness and grace. And we ask, God, that you cleanse us, that you empower us, provoke us, propel us forward to be your agents of light and justice. So together, Jesus, we pray, come with your empowerment and paths to justice. Midweek, we learned of the death of Mandy Schmidt's father, Paul. And Jesus, we pray, come with your comfort and compassion. We remember Carlos and Barb both recovering from surgeries. And for Pastor Terry at home, recovering from his infection as a result of his chemo. And Jesus, we pray, come with your healing touch and with your resiliency. God, we remember Rita and Sharon, both anticipating surgical procedures early this week. And so, Jesus, we, we pray, come with your power and your peace. This morning, God, we remember Tim and Anne, Luke and Jude Weens, as they move this week back, or they move this week to Newton, Kansas. Jesus, we pray, come. Be in the holy goodbyes and the holy hellos. God, this morning we remember all committed to learning, to growing, and to discovering. And we lift up our youth who will be baptized this month. Jesus, we pray, come with your glory and your joy. God, this morning we remember the gift of our high school seniors for Berkey. And Ava, Maddie, Tyler, Issa, Christina, Dylan, Seth, Tony, Miranda, Teresa, Carter, Clayton, and Sam. And Jesus, we pray, come with your guidance and your strength. God, this morning we remember our college students. And this week we specifically lift up Wes, studying at Goshen College. Jesus, we pray, come with the gift of your community and your encouragement. We remember the pastors and the Ministry Leadership Council as they meet this week to share what they have heard during our listening process. And Jesus, we pray, come with your wisdom and your grace. And God, we join with the psalmist and asking that you show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. We ask that you let us hear what you, the Lord, will speak, for we believe you will speak peace to your people, to your faithful, to those who turn to you in their hearts. Surely, God, your salvation is at hand for those who fear you that your glory may dwell in our land. God, we desperately long for the day when steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, when righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Our hearts pray for when faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. We trust that you, the Lord, will give what is good. And that righteousness, in fact, will go before you and will make a path for your steps. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Hi, Waterford kids. It's Pastor Katie. I invite you to come close to the screen and come listen for children's time. Today for Children's Time, we have a very familiar story, but we're going to hear it in a really different way. So I want you to pay careful attention and see if you notice what's different about our story today. Once there was a good shepherd. And the good shepherd had many sheep. And the shepherd loved the sheep very much and took care of all of the sheep. 
and the sheep lived in a sheep pen. where they could be safe and cared for. But one day, one of the sheep got lost. The good shepherd left the other sheep in the pen to go look for the lost sheep. And the shepherd looked and looked and looked and would not give up until the shepherd found the sheep. And the shepherd was so happy when the shepherd found the lost sheep. I wonder if you noticed what is different in our story today. Did you notice that the sheep that was lost, today I chose the sheep that has a dark color, while the other sheep have more lighter colors. This is because today we are talking about Black Lives Matter at church. You may have heard things and seen signs about Black Lives Matter, and it is a conversation about race. So I wonder about our story. I wonder why the sheep got lost. I wonder if the other sheep noticed when the sheep was lost. I wonder if the sheep were scared when the shepherd was away. Sometimes when we talk about, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we talk about how these sheep wonder if they still matter to the shepherd because the shepherd went after the other sheep. Our story gives us an answer. Our story says that yes, these sheep have always mattered to the shepherd. But also, the shepherd is especially concerned when there is a lost sheep. Many people in our world are speaking up. They are raising signs and they are saying things and saying it sometimes loudly. And they're saying things loudly because they're saying things aren't fair and they need to be more fair. Racism, when people aren't treated fair, is a sin. It is wrong, and it does not make the shepherd happy. And so we have to learn to use our voices to say that it is wrong, and to learn about it, to learn about what it means to have all of the sheep in the pen. and to learn how to celebrate all of the different colors of sheep. And we also remember that it's our job to learn how to make sure everybody is treated fair and to listen up when someone says, I'm not being treated fair.
there. That looks better. Today, I want you to color the Good Shepherd. Now, I know when I was a kid, and even more recently, sometimes I would often color with a crayon that looked like this, with the light peach color. And I would always color the face and the hands to match my skin. If your crayon actually says skin color that looks like this, you can just tear that part off because that's not accurate anymore. Never was accurate, actually. Skin colors come in all sorts of colors. Instead, you could write something like apricot or peach on there. But today, I want you to color the Good Shepherd using the brown crayon. I want you to give the, the Good Shepherd brown skin. And notice how beautiful the Good Shepherd looks with brown skin, too. Also, I have for you, these were sent out in your clipboard pages, so your parents can print them for you. This is three women who are African-American women who have made a huge difference in our world. Rosa Parks, Ruby Bridges, and Edna Lewis. Ask your parents to help you research and learn about these women. The last thing we can do is use sidewalk chalk to write Black Lives Matter on our driveways. Let's go. I'd like to try something new. Those of you who are able, please stand up. Okay, so I'm going to name some names. When you hear a name that you don't recognize, you can't tell me anything about them, I'd like you to take a seat and stay seated. The last person standing, we're going to see what they know, okay? <laughs> All right. Eric Garner. Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray. So those of you who are still standing, I'd like you to turn around and take a look. I'd, I'd say half to most of the people are still standing. So let's continue. Michelle Cousseau. Tanisha Anderson. Ara Russer. Megan Hockaday. So if we look around again, there are about four people still standing. And actually, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I just say that to encourage transparency so you can be seated. <laughs> So those of you who recognize the first group of names know that these were African Americans who've been killed by the police over the last two and a half years. What you may not know is that the other list is also African Americans who have been killed within the last two years. Only one thing distinguishes the names that you know from the names that you don't know. Gender. So let me first let you know that there's nothing at all distinct about this audience that explains the pattern of recognition that we've just seen. I've done this exercise dozens of times around the country. I've done it to women's rights organizations. I've done it with civil rights groups. I've done it with professors. I've done it with students. I've done it with psychologists. I've done it with sociologists. I've done it even with progressive members of Congress. And everywhere, the awareness of the level of police violence that black women experience is exceedingly low. 
Now, it is surprising, isn't it, that this would be the case? I mean, there are two issues involved here. There's police violence against African Americans, and there's violence against women, two issues that have been talked about a lot lately. But when we think about who is implicated by these problems, when we think about who's victimized by these problems, the names of these black women never come to mind. Now, communications experts tell us that when facts do not fit with the available frames, people have a difficult time incorporating new facts into their way of thinking about a problem. These women's names have slipped through our consciousness because there are no frames for us to see them, no frames for us to remember them, no frames for us to hold them. As a consequence, Reporters don't lead with them. Policymakers don't think about them. And, and politicians aren't encouraged or demanded that they speak to them. Now, you might ask, well, why does a frame matter? I mean, after all, an issue that affects black people and an issue that affects women, wouldn't that necessarily include black people who are women and women who are black people? Well, the simple answer is that this is a trickle-down approach to social justice, and many times it just doesn't work. Without frames that allow us to see how social problems impact all the members of a targeted group, many will fall through the cracks of our movements, left to suffer in virtual isolation. But it doesn't have to be this way. Many years ago, I began to use the term intersectionality to deal with the fact that many of our social justice problems like racism and sexism are often overlapping, creating multiple levels of social injustice. Now, the experience that gave rise to intersectionality was my chance encounter with a woman named Emma de Graffenried. Emma de Graffenried was an African-American woman, a working wife, and a mother. I actually read about Emma's story from the pages of a legal opinion written by a judge who had dismissed Emma's claim of race and gender discrimination against a local car manufacturing plant. Emma, like so many African-American women, sought better employment for her family and for others. She wanted to create a better life for her children and for her family. But she applied for a job, and she was not hired, and she believed that she was not hired because she was a black woman. Now, the judge in question dismissed Emma's suit. And the argument for dismissing the suit was that the employer did hire African Americans, and the employer hired women. The real problem, though, that the judge was not willing to acknowledge was what Emma was actually trying to say, that the African Americans that were hired, usually for industrial jobs, maintenance jobs, were all men. And the women that were hired, usually for secretarial or, or front office work, were all white. Only if the court was able to see how these policies came together would he be able to see the double discrimination that Emma de Graffenried was facing. But the court refused to allow Emma to put two causes of action together to tell her story because he believed that by allowing her to do that, she would be able to have preferential treatment. She'd have an advantage by being able to have two swings at the bat when African-American men and white women only had one swing at the bat. But, of course, neither African-American men or white women needed to combine a race and gender discrimination claim to tell the story of the discrimination they were experiencing. Why wasn't the real unfairness, law's refusal to protect African-American women, simply because their experiences weren't exactly the same as white women and African-American men.
Rather than broadening the frame to include African American women, the court simply tossed their case completely out of court. Now, as a student of anti-discrimination law, as a feminist, as an anti-racist, I was struck by this case. It, it, it felt to me like injustice squared. So, so first of all, black women weren't allowed to work at the plant. Second of all, the court doubled down on this exclusion by making it legally inconsequential. And to boot, there was no name for this problem. And we all know that where there's no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. And when you can't see a problem, you pretty much can't solve it. Many years later, I'd, I'd come to recognize that the problem that Emma was facing was a framing problem. The frame that the court was using to see gender discrimination or to see race discrimination was partial and it was distorting. For me, the, the challenge that I faced was trying to figure out whether there was an alternative narrative, a prism that would allow us to see Emma's dilemma, a, a prism that would allow us to rescue her from the cracks in the law that would allow judges to see her story. So it occurred to me, maybe a, a simple analogy to an intersection might allow judges to better see Emma's dilemma. So if we think about this intersection, the roads to the intersection would be the way that the workforce was structured by race and by gender. And then the traffic in those roads would be the hiring policies and, and the other practices that ran through those roads. Now, because Emma was both black and female, she was positioned precisely where those roads overlapped, experiencing the simultaneous impact of the company's gender and race traffic. The law, the law is like that ambulance that shows up and is ready to treat Emma only if it can be shown that she was harmed on the race road or on the gender road, but not where those roads intersected. So what do you call being impacted by multiple forces and then abandon to fend for yourself? Intersectionality seemed to do it for me. I would go on to learn that African-American women, like other women of color, like other socially marginalized people all over the world, were facing all kinds of dilemmas and challenges as a consequence of intersectionality, intersections of race and and gender, of heterosexism, transphobia, xenophobia, ableism, all of these social dynamics come together and create challenges that are sometimes quite unique. But in the same way that intersectionality raised our awareness to the way that black women live their lives, it also exposes the tragic circumstances under which African-American women die. Police violence against black women is very real. The level of violence that black women face is such that it's not surprising that some of them do not survive their encounters with police. Black girls as young as seven Great-grandmothers, as old as 95, have been killed by the police. They've been killed in their living rooms, in their bedrooms. They've been killed in their cars. They've been killed on the street. They've been killed in front of their parents, and they've been killed in front of their children. They have been shot to death. They have been stomped to death. They have been suffocated to death. They have been manhandled to death. They have been tasered to death. 
They've been killed when they've called for help. They've been killed when they were alone, and they've been killed when they were with others. They have been killed shopping while black, driving while black, having a mental disability while black, having a domestic disturbance while black. They've even been killed being homeless while black. They've been killed talking on the cell phone, laughing with friends, sitting in a car reported as stolen, and making a U-turn in front of the White House with an infant strapped in the back seat of the car. Why don't we know these stories? Why is it that their lost lives? Don't generate the same amount of media attention and communal outcry as the lost lives of their fallen brothers. It's time for a change. So what can we do? In 2014, the African American Policy Forum began to demand that we say her name at rallies. At protests, at conferences, at meetings, anywhere and everywhere that state violence against black bodies is being discussed. But saying her name is 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 not enough. We have to be willing to do more. We have to be willing to bear witness, to bear witness to the often painful realities that we would just rather not confront. The everyday violence and humiliation that many black women have had to face. Black women across color, age, gender expression, sexuality, and ability. So we have the opportunity right now, bearing in mind that some of the images that I'm about to share with you may be triggering for some, to collectively bear witness to some of this violence. We're going to hear the voice of the phenomenal Abby Dobson, and as we sit with these women, some who've experienced violence and. Some who have not survived them. We have an opportunity to reverse what happened at the beginning of this talk, when we could not stand for these women because we did not know their names. So at the end of this clip, there's going to be a roll call. Several black women's names will come up. I'd like those of you who are able to join us in saying these names as loud as you can, randomly, disorderly. Let's create a cacophony of sound to represent our intention to hold these women up, to sit with them, to bear witness to them, to bring them into the light. Say, say her name. Say, say her name. Johnson, Kayla Moore. 
the South is so. Rakia Boyd, Sally Frey, Tariga Yvette Smith. So I said at the beginning, if we can't see a problem, we can't fix a problem. Together, we've come together to bear witness to these women's lost lives. But the time now is to move from mourning and grief to action and transformation. This is something that we can do. It's up to us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in the suffering, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, Justice, joy, peace, sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cures for their ills, work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills. Land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak, voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like
Thank you all for joining me on this important journey of grief and lament and recognition. The journey is not over and the work is not done, but we have made a good start here together this morning. I will be reading a poem written by Reverend Dr. Yolanda Pierce as our sending message. Her poem is titled, A Litany for Those Who Aren't Ready for Healing. Let us not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Let us not rush to offer a band-aid when the gaping wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Let us not offer false equivalencies, thereby diminishing the particular pain being felt in a particular circumstance in a particular historical moment. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of reparations and restoration, or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved child. Let us not value property over people. Let us not protect material objects while human lives hang in the balance. Let us not value a false peace over a righteous justice. Let us not be afraid to sit with the ugliest, ugliness, the messiness, and the pain that is life and community together. Let us not offer cliches to the grieving, those whose hearts are being torn asunder. Let us mourn black and brown men and women, those killed extrajudicially judici every 28 hours. Let us lament the loss of a teenager, dead at the hands of a police officer who described him as a demon. Let us weep at a criminal justice system which is neither blind nor just. Let us call for the mourning men and the wailing women, those willing to rend their garments of privilege and ease and sit in the ashes of this nation's original sin. Let us be silent when we don't know what to say. Let us be humble and listen to the pain, rage, and grief pouring from the lips of our neighbors and friends. Let us decrease so that our brothers and sisters who live on the underside of history may increase. Let us pray with our eyes open and our feet firmly planted on the ground. Let us listen to the shattering glass and let us smell the purifying fires, for it is the language of the unheard. God, in your mercy, show me my own complicity in injustice. Convict me for my indifference. Forgive me when I have remained silent. Equip me with a zeal for righteousness. Never let me grow accustomed or acclimated to unrighteousness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.